Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to PhotoBiz Live. This is Andy from the PhotoBiz team, and today we're joined by Chelsea P., the PhotoBiz creative specialist, for a webinar about quick and easy logos and graphic design. In addition to getting the opportunity to learn from Chelsea in today's webinar, we will also have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. You may submit your questions using the chat tool, and they will be answered after the presentation. You can also join the discussion on Twitter by using the hashtag PhotoBizLive. If at any point during today's webinar you have difficulty hearing the speaker or seeing the slides, please use the comment box to let us know. We will be recording this webinar and it will be available for replay on our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash photobiz. With that being said, I'll turn things over to Chelsea. Thanks so much, Andy. Um, my name is Chelsea and I'm the creative specialist with the marketing team here at PhotoBiz and it's my pleasure to speak with you all this afternoon about quick and easy logos and graphic design. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> so uh, can't never could do anything. <laughs> There's a lot of misconceptions today about logo design and I always hear people all the time say, oh, you know, I can't design my own logo. I, mean, I don't have any experience with design, with Illustrator, or Photoshop, or I'm not creative enough. Well, you know, not in my house. <laughs> so by the end of this webinar, I hope to give you, you know, some of the knowledge and some easy tips and skills that are going to allow you to design your own logo. So this is what we're going to cover today. We're going to cover, you know, the basics of graphic design, you know, the ABCs of typography. You see what I did there? <laughs> the principles of logo design. And then we're going to go over, you know, some live examples. So I'm actually going to go ahead and build some, from scratch in several different programs some logo designs that, with some tools that you already have at your disposal. So hopefully by the end of this you'll be able to, to be, have some confidence to build your own logos. So let's go ahead and get started. So what really makes design good? <laughs> is it opinion or is there more to it? So <laughs> is, as a designer, before I even did um, some study on the psychology of design. I wasn't really able to, to pin down whether good design was based on talent or, or really ability or whether it was based on, on process or, um, or design principles. And this is really generally the case because beautiful design is created um, on a conscious and an unconscious level, which is kind of a cool concept <laughs> when you think about it. And it's not really a widely known fact. And so, so hang on folks, we're about to get deep here. <laughs> so here's an example, like, have you ever had a moment as a photographer when you created a really amazing image and then somebody asked you, you know, how were you able to create it? So if you think, if you answered that question, well, you know, I just clicked the shutter when it felt right, rather than, you know, I, I spent time framing my shot and, and adjusting my exposure to compensate for the conditions of the environment, and then when it felt really, really um, powerful and when, and when my, my subject was posed, then I clicked the shutter. You know, as a potential customer, I would feel more confident in the photographer's abilities with the second answer, you know? And that kind of brings me back to my point that there's a certain power in being able to identify and speak about what makes your work or your design powerful. And that, you know, once you're able to recognize something like that, it, it kind of unlocks a new level of perception. So the more you become conscious about how design works and, and things like that, the better you're able to communicate and judge your design decisions. So, that's going to help you in, in designing logos as well. And that's why I brought that up. So just for everyone who's always thought that they don't have a great design sense, well, you don't necessarily have to have the best design sense to have an eye for what looks appealing and what doesn't. And so design's kind of powerful because of the way our brain processes visuals as well. So usually people think about vision being, you know, our, the way that our eyes see images and, and projects them to the back of our mind. but you know, if this was the case, art and design really wouldn't exist. And so that kind of surprised me <laughs> to learn that, you know, there's in fact 30 different areas in the brain that, that process images when you're looking at them. So in fact, when you look at an image or when you look at a design, all of those different vision processing areas are individually recreating the
the design. So in a way, the viewer is also an artist when you think about it. So personally, I, I actually think that's pretty cool. <laughs> so in reality, design and art stimulate the mind more than a realistic image would do. And so this is why design and art affect us differently than realistic images do. So however, to the same effect, randomly placing objects on a screen or like a page, they're not going to have the same effect. So there's got to be a purpose to the, to the visual distortion or the arrangement for your mind to be able to pick it up. So you got to keep that in mind too. So that, that's kind of my, my segue into the basics of psychology behind design and what makes it kind of good. Uh, so now that we've got that taken care of, let's go ahead and dive right into uh, typography. So <laughs> the title of this slide is uh, one of my mantras, friends don't let friends use Comic Sans. <laughs> so I always remember to make sure that fonts are appropriate for the project that I'm designing. And let's face it, Comic Sans does not have a place in modern day graphic design. <laughs> so that brings us to the uh, general definition of typography. So what is it? Uh, typography is the art and the technique of arranging type in order to make language visible. So it sounds like a pretty vague definition, so I'll break it down for you. It's, it's more selecting typefaces, it's more like point size, it's deciding how long you want your lines to be, it's deciding about letting, which is uh, line spacing. It's tracking, which is the spacing between groups of letters, and it's also deciding about kerning, which is spacing between pairs of letters. So there's a lot that goes into typography. And then there's also dozens of different categories for typefaces. And so for our purposes, I'll go ahead and um, break it down into five really broad groups, kind of the broad group remix edition <laughs> to represent the majority of types that are used currently. And so the first one is geometric sans. And so these are going to be typefaces that are um, usually having really strict kind of strokes that are having the same width. And they're kind of having a less is more design that's kind of reminiscent of the Swiss movement from the, mis the, uh, the mid 20th century, uh, like the 1940s. It was a graphic design movement. And so they're, they're really clean and modern, but they've got more geometric kind of blocky forms. And so some examples are going to be Helvetica and Universe, uh, Franklin Gothic, Futura, and Avant-Garde. Uh, the next category that we've got is um, Humanist Sands. And so these are going to be typefaces that are based on handwriting. So they're going to be clean and modern, but they also have a kind of a human element that they retain. So some good examples of them are Myriad, Optima, Verdana, and my favorite, Gil Sands. <laughs> the next one is um, one of our oldest categories. Um, they're, they're kind of based on the evolution of calligraphic forms, which are more kind of classic and traditional, it's, it's, uh, hence the title of their category. Um, some examples are going to be Palatino, and one of the most notable is uh, Garamond, which actually kind of a cool fact about Garamond is that it was a font that was, at the time of its creation, it was considered so perfect that it's been around for about a century and a half, and no one's really tried to improve upon it, so uh, way to go. Claude Guermont. <laughs> uh, the next category that I got is uh, transitional and modern. And so these are going to be serif typefaces, which are the, actually serif and sans serif typefaces. The difference is going to be serif or have the little tails on the ends, <laughs> and sans serif don't. But these are serif typefaces, which are, they're created more in the 18th century, and they were the result of uh, type designers experimenting more with uh, kind of geometric, more geometric letter forms than the old style. So they've still got that old style design form, but they're moving towards a more modern, <laughs> more modern form, but we're going, we're going. <laughs> Some examples of the traditionals are Times New Roman and Baskerville, 
and some examples of the of the modern are Bodoni and Dida. And our last but not least category is slab serifs. These are kind of the oddballs. They are pretty distinctive and simple. They're serif faces, but they've got blocky elements to their serifs. And they've got the ability to add a lot of character when they're added to work, but I wouldn't use them really, I wouldn't use them for more than just titles. I wouldn't really use them for um, for a lot of copy, <laughs> so because uh, they've got a, a, the ability to be overwhelming when they're used in excess. So some examples of these are uh, Clarendon, Rockwell, and Courier. And so now that you've got some examples of a lot of typeface categories, and you know where they came from and things like that, you'll be able to judge more what fonts work in particular situations and what which ones don't. And in case you're not sure about where to go about finding some interesting new fonts, I've got some typeface resources that might be um, able to help with that. So some of my favorites are defont.com and fontsquirrel.com, and both of these are able to, you're able to get um, royalty-free and um, commercial-free downloads for fonts. And they've got some really great, um, really great font sources, so <laughs> I'd check those out if I were you. So let's go ahead and jump into the principles of logo design. So your logo is extremely, extremely important. So it's going to reflect basically your business's commercial brand. So it's, it's really essential to make sure that you reflect not only your business, but your audience, the target audience that you're going to want to reach in your logo. So for example, um, you got to think, is your business a serious company or are you wanting to be, you know, more whimsical? Um, does your industry, you know, have a certain theme? If you do, go ahead and try to use it in your logo. So, I mean, in that, to that same effect, try to think of these key principles when you're, when you're designing your logo. So, First off, uh, be describable and, and kind of be timeless. Don't jump on the latest um, bandwagon just because everyone else is doing it. So make sure that you're able to, to think of some way to have a logo that people know what your company is and know what you do. And so be memorable. So what, what makes your, your company stand out? Do you have uh, some sort of visual pun in your company name? If you do, that is awesome. <laughs> Try to use it in your logo design. If you can think of anything creative or or maybe even do you have a, a certain color that is really, really neat that you love, put it in your logo. Anything that you, you can think of to <laughs> make yourself memorable. Woo! There we go. Now the next one. Uh, let's be effective with or without color. This one is key because you never know when you might need to print your logo on something like a t-shirt or maybe embroidery because the le least amount of colors that you can, you can get by with, the cheaper that kind of printing is going to be. So, so that's always a good thing. And then the next one, be scalable. This one's always great too. Uh, you can you print a logo on a billboard, so I mean you would want a vector for that, something that could be printed huge, or I mean you want something that can be used in a favicon, something you know 16 by 16 pixels. So I mean think of something like that. What kind of um, applications are you going to want to use your logo in? So make sure that you can have some kind of symbolic element or are you going to use just a typeface logo. Think of where you're going to use it and, and make sure you can scale it to those kind of, kind of abilities. Um, and then the last but not least, use the appropriate typefaces or symbols for your logo. So for instance, if you're creating a logo for a, a target audience of you know, middle-aged business executives, you're not going to want to use a novelty typeface. You're going to want to use something that's more sophisticated. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's probably the, the easiest example I can think of. <laughs> and so if you create a logo that follows all those principles then that you feel you know, fully represents your business, then congratulations, you hit the logo jackpot. But generally, you're not going to hit the logo jackpot on your first try. So if at first you don't succeed, I mean, my only advice to you is 
don't give up. If at first you don't succeed, keep all of your versions and build upon the strengths of each of your iterations. There are good aspects of all of the versions that you that you do, and I would I would just build upon that. Here are some examples of the good, the bad, and the ugly for some inspiration. Starting with the good, let's talk about the legendary FedEx logo, which was designed by uh, Lyndon Leader in 1994. This one's one of my favorites because um, it's a successful logo type, and he he basically. He's really, really big on minimalism, and he altered two different typefaces to create it. And he integrated negative space to create this um, this little arrow that's hidden in between the capital E and the X. And so, I'm not sure how many people uh, recognized it, but uh, not a whole lot of people notice it. But I'm a big fan of this one. The next one in the good category is Mikey. So this one is one of my favorites because it's a great symbolic logo. It was designed by Carolyn Davidson in 1971, and a cool thing about this one is that she was only paid $35 to design this logo, and they've been using it since 1971. So, <laughs> just interesting fact. Um, but the cool thing about it is that it's successful because you don't really necessarily need the name of the company to to have people recognize it. So to that effect, you know, if you can think of a symbol or some kind of, you know, abstract element that can represent your company that well, use it. And some other good examples from recent history are um, Apple, of course. They've got a great logo. Twitter. They actually, a uh, cool fact about Twitter, they bought that bird logo off of iStock for about 15 bucks. <laughs> And then they uh, they altered it a bit over the, the past couple of years, but goodbye on their part. And then uh, McDonald's, that's a great symbol logo mark. And Facebook. So all of those are great symbol marks because they, I mean, you don't need the company name to recognize them. And let's move on to the bad <laughs> with one of the most controversial logos in recent history. And that's the London Olympics logo from 2012. And it was designed by uh, Wolf Allens. And it was a really controversial design. And I think uh, the reason that it received so much negative criticism is really because of kind of the disjointed, you know, angular design. Because it really makes it hard for the brain to really decipher, you know, what's going on. That plus um, they used a lot of kind of crazy colors <laughs> in that logo. Um, and apparently the designers did have a grid in mind when they designed it, but and it's I uh, I included that grid to the to the right of that image, but I'm not really sure if you can consider that a grid, but you know, to each his own. And an interesting fact about that logo is that Iran threatened to boycott the games because they thought that the logo used the word Zion in it. So that just goes to show you that if your audience is worldwide, it's it's really, really important that you make sure that you're aware of cultural differences that may affect your logo design. So and the next one on the bad list is the Bing logo from 2009. <laughs> so it was designed by the Razorfish Agency, and it was really criticized for being a bad logo because um, designers stated that they uh, created the letter forms from scratch, but oh, they appeared to be from a scaled typeface. So it, it really, it really did look kind of kind of amateurish to a lot of graphic designers, so it, it got a lot of criticism. And so moving on to the ugly. <laughs> so this one is the GAT logo redesign of 2010. This one was designed by Laird and Partners. And so this one, they what happened was that they went from their traditional logo to this brand new logo, which was a little more modern but it received so much backlash on social media and, and reviews and in, in their stores, they, their sales went down, um, just tons and tons of backlash, that they switched back to their old logo within, I think it was about four to five days. So it just kind of goes to show when you're redesigning your logo, 
you got to respect the equity that you might have with your existing identity and just don't completely you know scrap your old logo and, and start with a clean slate and then the last one I've got for you is the detail doctor and this one kind of hurts my heart I included this one because it's got a couple of good examples of what not to do when you're designing the logo and the first one is the inappropriate font choice uh, this one's got another font that I include on the the no no font list it's papyrus I feel like it, it kind of makes this company look silly it could probably benefit from a, a more sophisticated font choice so that's just a, another hint always make sure your typeface matches your company or your target audience and then another thing that makes this logo a little bit unsuccessful is that the graphic or the symbolic element of it, it, it seems a little bit unfinished. So, you know, the car doesn't have the wheels and it just, it seems like they just kind of gave up on, on that design. I mean, I don't know if it, it kind of resembles a UFO a little bit. I, I don't know. It's, it definitely just doesn't reflect what the company, it doesn't say that the company pays attention to detail. Since we've gone over a lot of all that information and I've given you the basics of logo design and typography and the psychology of design, so let's go ahead and, and start creating some logos. Let's get to the fun stuff. So since I'm known around the office as the Photoshop Jedi, we'll go ahead and start with Photoshop. I created um, most of these logos in about 10 to 15 minutes. Now some people are going to cringe at the at the fact that I created a logo in Photoshop but you know in the past couple of years Photoshop's actually gotten a lot better at their their design features I mean I w it is still a, a raster based graphics program but if you're using shape layers and if you're using smart objects and and type layers then you should be okay <laughs> so let's go ahead and um, we'll start with this vertical shutter snaps logo and our little square aperture um, symbol, which is pretty easy to create using our shape layers. Uh, so we'll go ahead and um, I'll start out by just recreating it. I used um, just some random fonts that I found, I believe, on dafont.com. But we'll go ahead and well, we'll make it a little bit smaller first. And maybe slightly smaller. There we go. And then Go ahead and just create the photography. And I'll go ahead and make it I'll do this one in kind of a monochrome version. I'll do it right here. So we've got our type layers, and then they don't have to necessarily be on two lines by any means. It's it's kind of a personal preference. And then to do the actual aperture, let's go ahead and um, you just grab the rounded rectangle which is nested under the regular rectangle tool and then hold shift while you create it and then you can fill it with whatever color you want but I usually make sure that the radius for the corners is around 10 pixels and if you're using Photoshop CS6 or uh, CC you can adjust the radius um, using the properties panel too and then I'll bring that back over And then I'll grab my polygon tool, which is also nested under the rectangle. And I'll fill that one with white. And I'll make sure it's got six sides because it will be the aperture. And again, I will hold shift 
and we'll grab it and then we'll turn it a little bit here we go number two around the middle there we go now if I wasn't in a rush I would probably put guides and, and music read, but a little bit of a time crunch. And then once we've got our polygon laid out in the middle, we'll do the, the leafs of our shutter using the line tool. So basically you just build those off from the edges of the polygon. So you just go off of those. So they just go like this. So just go straight to the edges. And I just fill those with white. So they would just go like that. But let's make them a little bit wider. It's probably going to be quicker for me to just do it a different way. <laughs> there we go. There's the winner. Oh no, I did it the wrong way. <laughs> And then one more. And there we go. So we have a tiny aperture. And we got our logo. So there's the one in Photoshop. And then we'll go through. And then when I'm creating one in Photoshop, you can go ahead and um, you can export it as either a JPEG, you can do a PNG by just turning off your background layer and cropping it to whatever size you want and just saving it as a PNG. You can do a Photoshop EPS, you can do um, a Photoshop PDF, I mean there's a lot of different formats you can you can save it as. And then if you wanted to do um, kind of the effect that I got with uh, this one, all I did was I just um, did some masking on top of that layer. So it's pretty simple. And then for the next one, we'll go ahead and get into Illustrator, where I created one with a little camera. So for that, it's pretty easy. So I did the same thing where I just typed out my lettering. And for this one, I already went ahead and created outlines from everything which makes everything easier uh, if you want to get things printed in the long run. But I'll go ahead and retype everything out. Well, we've got that. And then to make our little camera, all I did was I just used shape layers. 
And so the first one is just a rectangle. So I'll make that one. So it's just one single rectangle. And then the little buttons are also rectangles. So we have one button, two buttons. And then I use the polygon tool for our viewfinder. So it's just about that size-ish. We can go down a little bit. So here we've got the basics of the camera, and then now we just have to make the lens, which I did from an ellipse, and I just filled it with white. So. Now the ellipse is just two different circles, so I just did the first one. Just make it about the middle, and then I just copied it, pasted, and for the second one, I just sized it down using the shift key, moved it about in the middle, and I just put a stroke on it. So let's make the stroke a little bit bigger. And there you go. So that one's easy enough. And now you have a little camera. And then the last one that we'll do today is just using a free program uh, called GIMP, which is a little less robust than uh, Illustrator and Photoshop, but you can still make logos in it. So I'll make a simple, um, just a regular typography logo with uh, GIMP. It's still, if you're familiar with Photoshop and Illustrator, it's got a, a relatively similar interface, so you can still use lo uh, layers and, and things, but but it's, like I said, it's not as robust of a program. So with this one, we'll go ahead and you can still type out whatever you want to type out, and you can still, it uses the same fonts that you have within your computer already. So we can go ahead and, let's say, we can make this one, let's say we'll make this one kind of kind of classier. Uh, I, I have way too many fonts. So we'll do that. And then... For this one, make it a little bit more elegant. Ooh, not that large. And see, when you're experimenting with fonts, you can you can tell right away when something's not going to work. So, like that font's not going to work, and that font's not going to work. Then let's see. But you've got like a simple, easy to recognize little logo. And then you can export in a lot of different formats from GIMP. You can do a PNG, you can do a JPEG, and in both of those image formats you can upload to your photo this site. So you can use and this is a free software, so if you don't have access to Photoshop or Illustrator, you can definitely use this to create logos. You can do raw files, you can do Photoshop files, so if you're in a pinch, this is definitely something that can work for you. And if you want to get fancy, you can also do kind of shape layers and you can use brushes and things like that. So yeah, that's pretty much it. So I hope I've given you enough information today to go out on your own and create some awesome logos for your businesses. And so now I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Annie so we can open it up for Q&A. Thank you for that great presentation, <laughs> Chelsea. Uh, we're now going to answer questions from the audience. Uh, remember, if you do have a question, please submit it using the question box in the webinar software. 
All right, had an early question from Suzanne. What typeface do you use on your slides? Oh, on my slides, I use um, Futura, actually. All right. Uh, and here I have a question from Nanette. What works best as far as logo shapes? Uh, we have a very long name, and I've struggled with how to shape the logo. Um, Nanette, generally, it kind of if you're working with like a photo of a site, I usually will make two different versions of my logo. So I've got a horizontal logo that kind of goes and spans across the top. So like since you've got a long name, that'll probably work best for you. And then you can also put your logo, I mean, if you've got a, a longer name, you can put it on a couple lines too. So that would work best if you've got a, maybe a template that has a logo that has a logo space that has maybe a shorter area or maybe a more square logo space. So I mean there's a couple different options that you can use and if you ha have any more questions about it you can definitely contact me and I can help you out with it or you can contact support too they're always willing to help. Alright, uh, do we have any more questions from the audience today? Ah, here we go. Uh, and this one is from Pam. Well, uh, Pam didn't actually have a question, but Pam would like to let you know that uh, she's never been that successful and has hired a graphic designer, but she feels like she can do it on her own now and wants to say thank you, as does Nanette. Oh, you're welcome, Pam. <laughs> you're welcome too, Nanette. Okay, any last questions? Going once. Okay, uh, Nanette would also like to know if there are any rules about what typefaces go together. Well, there aren't any technical written down rules, but there are, some graphic designers will will tell you that you know there are some unwritten rules about what goes and what doesn't. Generally, what the the rules that I go by are you know you can kind of kind of tell um, it's a personal preference really what kind of kind of flows together. Um, I'll normally. I won't put a um, a serif and a and a two really really different serifs together. So like an old style font with uh, like a, a slab serif. I won't put those together because they're they're so contrasting. But things like um, like you, I wouldn't put something that um, that doesn't match really. <laughs> And it's kind of something that, it's one of those things that you'll know it when you see it. <laughs> it's hard to explain. I, like, I wouldn't put a novelty font with a, with a really um, sophisticated font, like an old style font. Like, I wouldn't put, uh, say, Papyrus with uh, Times New Roman. Or I wouldn't put um, Museo with, um, with Baskerville. Something like that. Okay, I have a few more questions coming in, so uh, sure. not not to rush you. Uh, oh, Robert no Robert asks, can you provide info if we can do these or similar functions in Lightroom? Um, in Lightroom, I'm not as familiar with it, but I I mean I don't it, it Lightroom is a raster based program, so I wouldn't recommend it as much, just because of the fact that it it's kind of like Photoshop where you might run the risk of not being able to size it up and down as much. So I would recommend if you're going to do logos and you're going to be you're really serious about it, I would recommend over all of the programs I've used today, I would recommend Illustrator because it's a vector-based program. So you're going to be able to get the most use out of it from that. I think I muted my mic as I asked that question. Uh, ah. <laughs> question from Sarah H. Uh, where do you recommend getting stock image illustrations or inspiration from? Um, stock images, I usually, there's a lot of different stock agencies, so, I mean, you can go to iStock, there's, um, Big Stock actually has a lot of great stuff, I mean, it's kind of a personal preference, really, um, I like looking at a lot of patterns when, I, when I'm looking for logo inspiration, um, there's also, when you're, when you're doing logo stuff, there's a lot of different sites, um, that have good insight about logo inspiration. So I would just do a search on Google for, you know, logo design inspiration. There's a lot of good web design sites that have, uh, like, reviews on logos, and that'll give you a good starting point. So I'd probably recommend that. All right. Uh, quick question from Cheryl. Uh, how would you like anyone who would like to contact you, how would you like them to reach you? Oh, you can, you can definitely email me. Um, it's just chelseap at photobiz.com. That's going to be C-H-E-L-S-E-A-P at photobiz.com.
Another uh, question from Pam this time. Uh, would it be okay to use two different logos for one's business? Uh, say if you have a family and child business and a wedding business, or should you just have one? I would say in, it kind of depends on the case. So if, you, if you've separated your businesses like that, if you've really separated them, um, so like if you have two different websites, like two completely separate websites, then yeah, I would do two different logos. But if you've got two separate websites for them and they're kind of under a blanketed company, like a, a one big umbrella company, then I would do one logo. All right, uh, question from Valerie. What size do you build your vector-based logos at? When you're doing vector logos, it kind of doesn't really matter what size you, you build them at because vector logos, they can be scaled to whatever size you want. So when I'm building a vector logo, I'll usually start, I'll build my canvas at, um, I mean, I, I usually just do, um, it depends on what I'm making. Uh, so. Like if, for instance, if I'm doing something for print, I'll um, I'll start it at whatever the the size of, of whatever the specifications I'm I'm building are. But if I'm doing something for web, I'll start it at maybe um, 1276 by 720. I think is the is a general uh, web size. But it, it really doesn't matter when it comes to vectors because they can be sized up and down and and they don't lose the image quality like raster graphics do. But when you're working with, with uh, raster graphics, it's kind of important to remember um, that, you know, in, like for instance in Photoshop, it's a good thing that you can use like things like smart objects and, and you're not going to lose the image quality. They kind of retain the original file size and you can still size them up and down, but it's going to keep that original size and it's kind of in its metadata memory and you're not going to lose that original image quality. So, I mean, you can still kind of, kind of I guess, kind of build things and, and design graphics in Photoshop in a similar way that you can do do vectors, but it's not really the same since it is a raster-based program. I mean, and this is coming from somebody who absolutely loves Photoshop. So. All right, uh, real quick one from Jim. He'd like to know what the name of the last program you used was, and uh, if you wouldn't mind tossing in where to find it. Yeah, it's um, it's GIMP. It's G-I-M-P, and you can get it. Uh, it's a free download. You can get it from GIMP.org. All right. Uh, one last call for questions. All right. If you have a question that comes up a little bit later that you haven't thought of today, uh, Chelsea has said you can email her at chelseap at photobiz.com. Uh, if you need some help getting your logo onto your website, don't forget you can call or submit a ticket to our passionate support team. They're here Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. until 8 p.m., and they are always happy to help you. Mm -hmm. All right, so thank you everyone for the great questions, and thank you so much, Chelsea, for taking time to present today, and thank you for everyone who joined us today. A recording of today's webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash photobiz. Also, be sure to check out our blog and watch your email for updates about our future webinars. Uh, we've just posted October's schedule uh, today, and you probably have received an email about that. Uh, our next webinar will be High Volume Sports Composites and Products by Richard Sturdivant of Sturdivant Studios uh, next Tuesday, October 1st. Thank you again, Chelsea. That concludes this episode of PhotoBiz Live. Have a great day, everyone.